USA! USA! The Trump zealots who stormed the Capitol building on January 6th were part of a growing far-right movement. Let's go! You guys are savage! Let's go! Break it down! Break it down! And that was sound gathered during the assault on the U.S. Capitol building on January 6th of this year. And you hear the crowd smashing the building's windows and the police shooting a right-wing rioter. Um, And this is an excerpt from a recording by the right-wing group Insurgents USA. I'm Bob Lederer of OutFM, here with John Riley. Last week, we brought you part one of our interview with two progressive journalists who are experts on the far right in this country looking at what the January 6th violent assault on the U.S. Capitol building revealed about the sometimes conflicting factions on the far right. Tonight, we bring you the second and final part of this interview. The Capitol attack, of course, aimed to stop the certification of Biden's election. It left five people dead and scores injured. It spotlighted the far right, a movement that has been steadily building in this country for decades. From the months of murderous attacks last year against the Black Lives Matter and related movements, these far-right groups, including Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, QAnon, and others, all of them strongly white supremacists with some waving Confederate flags, were heavily involved in the January 6th assault on the Capitol. Our first guest for this discussion was Matthew Lyons, who has been writing about right-wing politics for over 25 years. He's the author of the book, Insurgent Supremacists, the U.S. Far Right's Challenge to State and Empire, that was published in 2018, and also earlier was co-author in the year 2000 with Chip Berlay uh, of the book, Right Wing Populism in America. Matthew is also a regular contributor to the radical anti-fascist blog, Three Way Fight. Matthew is a white, Jewish, cis, heterosexual man. Matthew was also joined in our interview by Chloe, who does investigative reporting and analysis on the far right and related issues. She's also a contributor to the Three Way Fight blog. Chloe is a white, Jewish, cis, queer woman based in California. So first, let's hear a few highlights of last week's interview with Chloe and Matthew Lyons. First, you'll hear Matthew, followed by Chloe. The, the far right's attitude toward the ruling class, this notion of the existing political system being illegitimate is very much tied in with the sense that the political elites and economic and cultural elites have betrayed them, that uh, the people who used to be defenders of you know, traditional social hierarchies and, and systems of oppression they're, they're no longer doing that job in, in the way that the, the far right forces want them to do. The groups of people that came together to storm the Capitol that day were really actually more of a mixed bag. Um, some of them were uh, far right, have been organized since the Obama administration and definitely insurrectionary. Um, but others were really recently politicized uh, under Trump and definitely since Stop the Steal. And it was pretty evident at the Capitol that day that there was no actually coherent um, leadership and that there was, we both would argue, there was no coherent leadership that was actually attempting to fully overthrow the state per se or um, institute a new form of governance. Marjorie Taylor Greene, Um, who really rose to fame in Georgia partially through kind of being as um, bold, far right, anti-LGBTQ, anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant as she could in some ways, and kind of as a way to almost gain fame and to gain a liking within various far right movements. You can specifically see early on that she was like really, 
So she herself identifies as Christian. She speaks a lot of kind of language that is specifically re referencing the Christian right and of also the Patriot movement. But early on, one of in her Twitter feeds, for example, she's talking about how the drag queens in the area are having a drag queen reading group and how the reading group is a way that they're trying to advance a neo-Marxist agenda. And you can see how that type of quote goes viral and is liked by so many different people in her midst. Now that she has actually made it into Congress, she's already uh, sponsoring a bill that would make it so that young trans and genderqueer athletes can't compete um, in women's sports in schools. And now we go to part two of our interview with investigative writers Matthew Lyons and Chloe of the blog Three Way Fight on the resurgence of the far right in the United States. Uh, last time we talked about the different strains of thought and different um, ways of approaching organizing within the far right. One of those sectors are uh, activists who could accurately be labeled fascist, but yet the word that's on the lips, not only of many leftists, but even liberals and, and increasingly centrists is that this whole movement on the right is fascist and these are a, a bunch of fascists as a whole um, and and they use that not only to refer to trump and his supporters but um uh many of the followers on the far right so i want to ask both of you um how you view this uh last month uh, in an essay Matthew Lyons wrote, quote, although Trump has promoted fascistic politics and policies in various ways, key elements of fascism as an overall project were missing. Now, uh, however, Trump has embraced two of the elements and, and um, I'll ask you to spell out what those elements are. Um, Trumpism, Matthew writes, might not represent full blown fascism yet, but it is rushing in that direction. So Matthew, let's start with you. What's the difference between full-blown fascism and what the far right is currently organizing for, or at least major elements of it? I, I should say, first of all, that you know the term fascism is something that people use in a lot of different ways. And I don't want to claim that my use of the term is the only correct one or that it's the, the last word on the subject. Um, I do think that it's important to use, to be clear about what we mean and to use it in a way that's not just equivalent to any kind of right-wing authoritarian um, politics. Um, and in, in terms of Trump specifically, uh, I mean, there are people who have argued, you know, you know, for the past several years that, you know, he's been a fascist and that his, his uh, presidency has been fascist and so on. I don't agree with that but I wanna be specific about why and uh, why that is changing now. Um, the, the, the key elements that I was referring to in that quote of what in my mind is involved in, in genuine fascism, one of them is a rejection of the existing political system uh, and uh, just the, the notion that uh, we need to achieve political goals through some other means that involves a radical change to the, the political system. Secondly, an organized mass mobilization outside of the uh, established channels and the existing uh, conventional political uh, organizations. So not simply using the Republican Party as, uh, as, as a uh, vehicle for your goals. And the third one is a kind of systematic or totalizing effort to transform society according to or in, 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 in accordance with some kind of overall ideological vision. Um, and so the kind of developments that we've seen with Trump and his, uh, his following over the last few months uh, first of all, we've seen a major shift in uh, the 
view of the political system where uh, in, in the process of claiming that the, the presidential election is a fraud, Trump and his followers have basically said, this is not a legitimate government. It's not a legi legitimate uh, administration. Um, secondly, um, we're seeing at least the uh, beginnings of a uh, shift from the Republican Party as the vehicle for Trumpism to uh, a movement that is really outside of and to a certain extent at odds with the Republican Party. Um, it, it, it's something that is, it's very much in flux. It's not, it's not clearly formed, it's, it's very fragmented, but it's, it's at least moved in that direction. And then in terms of the notion of an uh, overall ideological vision um, for transforming society, I don't wanna claim that you know, there is some kind of unified vision for uh, all of the people who attack the US Capitol or the people who are, um, you know, continuing to reject the, the last presidential uh, election results. But I do think that there are a lot of people within those forces who have that kind of a vision. It's a question of whether they can you know, come to some agreement about that or, you know, whether one of those visions can win out. That's very uh, uncertain and it, it may not, it may not happen, but I think there's at least been a major shift in, 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 towards something much closer to uh, full-fledged fascism than, than what Trump and his following represented um, not too long ago. Well, I now want to turn to the state's response to the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Um, and uh, in an essay published on uh, January 13th, just uh, a week later, uh, our guest Chloe, together with her co-author B. Sander, wrote the following, quote, few movements can withstand the kind of repression they are about to face not to mention the likelihood that the movement is already widely infiltrated by state forces. Many new so-called movement leaders will eventually be exposed as undercover state operatives. Either way, under the banner of Stop the Steal, right-wing forces will be claiming victory for years, unquote. And um, as of the date we're recording this on February 5th, there's 235 people who've been charged in the Capitol riot uh, so far, and undoubtedly more indictments to come. So um, let me start with you, Chloe, and ask how you expect, as you look into the coming months, that the nature of state repression of the far right will unfold? And on what basis do you think these far right forces can claim victory for years to come? I think we're already seeing, um, as you mentioned, a fairly uh, robust form of repression that's happening in the wake of the Capitol takeover um, with people being charged for, for sedition and other um, fairly high stakes charges. And I think more, kind of more importantly, you can see how um, the Democratic Party is really taking the far right threat kind of seriously in a whole new way and making it part of their um, campaign and part of their priorities right now. And debates happening on CNN and on various kind of uh, establishment and liberal news that is finally really um, understanding that there have actually been calls for quite a long time to understand the far right and white nationalists as a threat. And so I just think that you're going to see a whole new um, clamp down on far right forces. And we've already been seeing it with the deplatforming that's been happening. And we all know that when that kind of repression comes down, it's a lot of pressure on some of the parts of the movements that are more newly formed and will most likely result in more fractures 
in some people leaving the movement, in some demoral demoralization. At the same time, um, I, as we mentioned in that, in that one paragraph that you just read, this is also a huge victory that they were able to make it inside of the walls of the Capitol. And I think whether it's some of the movements that are currently um, organizing right now or in some generations to come, I think it will be seen you know, by many as, as a victory. And I think for some of the people who were there who may also be in some of the more sophisticated groups that most likely won't immediately come under charges, having successfully made it into the Capitol will also be able to be a means for further recruitment and for kind of deeper and more long-term organizing. Uh, Matthew Lyons. Something that I think is important to keep in mind when we're talking about state repression against the far right is that whatever um, Joe Biden says, whatever other public officials say, it's not being carried out in order to protect democracy or to protect people's rights or people's freedoms. It's being carried out to protect the state order to, and to protect the ruling class. The far right is a threat to the system of rule that um, exists in this country at this time. Uh, it's not a threat in the sense that it is seeking to carry out liberatory change that would um, uh, be you know, uh, anything we would want, but it is disruptive and disorderly and dangerous to the kind of order that um, the, the powers that be want. And um, so uh, that, um, that means that um, a, a lot of the same kinds of um, approaches and tactics that are used against the left may be used against the right. Now, it's not completely symmetrical. It's, it's unlikely that you will see um, a targeted assassination of um, Proud Boys leaders or Oath Keepers in the way that you saw targeted assassination of um, Black Panthers or American Indian movement leaders in the past. Um, but there are many other kinds of um, repression, both above above ground or you know uh, both uh, open and covert that can be and probably will be carried out in order to contain the threat and and um, direct it into safer channels that may mean um, boosting up groups that um, may talk about um, uh, hostility to elites, but put most of their energy into attacking communities of color, for example, or LGBT communities, um, as opposed to groups that um, actually try to direct some of their um, militancy against the state. So that kind of um, repressive uh, operations is, 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 is something that is likely to, to, to go forward. And um, for for those who may not have heard the uh, part one, the earlier segment, maybe Matthew, you could just briefly summarize the concern that you and, and many observers of the far right have about the use of the attack on the Capitol as a, as a pretext to say, well, we really need domestic terrorism legislation that gives the FBI and local police departments far more powers to um, to block these groups and, and dismantle them, et cetera. Just tell us in a nutshell what the what you see as the dangers of that type of legislative move that moves that are already unfolding. Well, um, in, in broad terms, the 
uh, danger is that the threat of the threat posed by the far right will be used as a scapegoat to build up the forces of the repressive apparatus, the state uh, security forces and the, um, uh, the prison system, the police and so on. Uh, and that um, again and again has gone forward in ways that end up rebounding worse against the left and against oppressed communities. We saw that uh, most dramatically in World War II when there was the mass imprisonment of Japanese Americans carried out in the name of, an, of the anti-fascist war. And on a smaller scale, we've seen that um, through various kinds of legislation and um, other state measures that uh, have happened in, in recent decades in response to uh, right-wing attack. All right. Um, now I'd like to talk about a sector of the right wing that uh, we haven't heard much about in the last couple of years, and that's the so-called alt-right. Um, now, Matthew, when we interviewed you five years ago, um, the most prominent group was led by open pro-Nazi Richard Spencer. Um, but another group had uh, an out gay spokesperson, um, Milo Yiannopoulos. Um, now, Spencer became a leader of the notorious and murderous Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia to defend Confederate statues that led to the murder by vehicle of white anti-racist Heather Heyer and the beating of several anti-fascist protesters. Trump, as we know, famously defended the racists who organized that. Um, but Matthew, you have written that the wide popular backlash against the Charlottesville riot led to a near collapse of the alt-right. Um, and um, meanwhile, Yiannopoulos um, fell out of favor uh, fairly quickly after that and uh, actually released a, a, a recording a couple of years later um, showing Spencer saying, quote, little effing kikes, uh, they get ruled by people like me, unquote, and other anti-Semitic and uh, racist comments. So uh, Matthew, I'd like you to talk about two aspects of this. One is the role of out gay, openly gay people in the alt-right and any other parts of the right where they've been open um, and how their presence furthered the kind of re remake or re rebranding of that part of the right. Um, and uh, then what were the factors that led to the disintegration of the alt-right and, and where that stands today? The alt-right um, uh, is or, or you know, was a, um, a kind of a, 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 a a convergence point for various different right-wing ideological currents, and I'm, I'm going to all the details, but um, it involved sectors of a kind of racial nationalist tradition um, that included some elements that identified as Nazi and others that were different from that. Uh, including some that uh, were open to uh, Jews participating as long as they towed the line in terms of uh, white nationalism. Uh, but then other elements, including a, a, a lot of influence by um, uh, groups associated with the so-called manosphere, which was a subculture, an online subculture that um, developed over the, the past decade or so uh, uh, with a big emphasis on uh, combating feminism on the surface level, but uh, uh, more uh, substantively really um, promoting a, 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 a quite vicious forms of misogyny and um, uh, male supremacism. And um, within this context, you've had various different forces. And so Spencer and Yiannopoulos in some ways represented different wings. 
Spencer representing more of the um, uh, oppositional wing in the sense of people who regarded the existing political system as illegitimate and Yiannopoulos representing what was often called the alt light, meaning people who took some of the elements of you know, the full alt-right ideology and applied them in, in ways that would be more palatable to mainstream audiences. So often toning down the more explicit kinds of uh, uh, racist rhetoric uh, and, and also working more directly with um, the uh, Trump administration and other um, you know, parts of the government. So Yiannopoulos was an editor at Breitbart News which was headed by Steve Bannon, who um, in the first um, six months or so of the Trump administration was one of Trump's top advisors in the, in the White House. In terms of the role of out gay people in the alt-right, there were some sections of the alt-right where there was, there was there was space open for specifically gay men. I, I mean, there was not really any space for um, lesbians um, and certainly not for trans people, but certain space for gay men who um, embraced uh, the basic precepts of, of alt-right philosophy. Some of this was centered in a kind of white nationalism uh, some of it was centered in politics that were based more on misogyny and male dominance. Jack Donovan uh, is a prime example as a, a alt-right uh, activist and writer who espoused the philosophy of male tribalism. It was a complicated relationship. There was certainly plenty of homophobia within the alt-right, but there was, you know, it, it, there was a kind of conditional acceptance, uh, somewhat analogous to the ways that um, some sectors of the, the far right have um, been open to including people of color as long as they um, uh, don't challenge the uh, overarching system of racial oppression. All right. So as we wrap up, I want to ask Chloe um, to just uh, leave our listeners with some direction as to how people who consider themselves to be on the left or in the progressive community should be responding to the resurgent far right overall. What are some strategic points you would advise? Thanks for that opportunity. I think one, it's really important to understand that there is this threat of the insurgent far right, but that also we you know, have already been up against for so long a state and system that has already not viewed many of our humanity um, as central to its core goal <laughs> or it's, it's, it's a, as center, central to its core. And so I do think, as I had said previously, that it is really important while we take a moment to understand that the far right is also a threat to our communities to really kind of reinforce that there, there is the possibility of an alternative to both um, capitalism and you know, systemic white supremacy and structures of white nationalism and Christian nationalism that have oppressed communities for a long time and this insurgent far right and I think we need to keep our eyes on the prize in um, looking towards that. But also I do think that this is a moment to um, really try to be networked in with other types of groups and um, to have a good sense of developing movement security and to um, you know, understand which, which groups are out there that are able to provide resources um, to make sure that you're, that if you are or somebody that you know is under direct threat, that you have people to call on to have your back. So those are a couple of things, but um, Matthew, do you have anything else to add? 
Well, I, I just would add that um, we've seen, you know, this has been a very difficult and scary and dangerous time over the past few years, but it's also been a time when there's been tremendous vitality and, uh, and, and creativity and, and, and success of um, people rising up and organizing and, and uh, combating the, the, the systems that uh, oppress us. Um, I mean, we've saw that, you know, with the, the uprisings against white supremacy and police violence over this past year. We've also seen it with uh, some very effective organizing that took place uh, a few years ago to shut down the alt-right and, and their efforts to mobilize. So I think that there's some real models and some real positive examples that we can look to and, and draw lessons from it. It's worth studying those in, in, uh, in some detail. Well, I want to thank our guest, Matthew Lyons, who's a researcher and writer on focused on right wing politics for well, more than 25 years. He's the author of Insurgent Supremacist, the U.S. Far Right's Challenge to State and Empire, came out three years ago. And um, it, in 2000, was the co-author with Chip Berlay of Right Wing Populism in America. And he's a contributor to the radical anti-fascist blog, Three Way Fight. Um, and also Chloe, uh, who's an investigative reporter who does uh, analysis of the far right and other issues. She's a, a contributor as well uh, to Three Way Fight. Um, and um, you can read their work and the, that of other writers at threewayfight.blogspot.com. And um, so that's it for this segment on Out FM. I'm Bob Lederer, and I want to thank uh, my co-producer and co-host John Riley for all of his um, both theoretical work on this interview and um, his uh, engineering and uh, technical assistance. And for those of you who want to go back and listen to part one, uh, just go to our website and you can actually watch it as a video um, at outfm.org. And um, until next week, uh, stay healthy, stay strong, and we'll see you soon. Good night.